Hi, uh, welcome to the uh, security boff that we're going to be doing tonight. Um, my name is Brad Wetmore and uh, to my right is Jeff Nicewanger. Um, I am one of the uh, security engineers that works with the core libraries in the JDK. Uh, Jeff is our security architect and uh, we've collectively been on this for about 20 something years so we have a little bit of history with the group but uh, this is actually pretty good. Uh, usually we get the Thursday night at 9.30 crowd and everyone's kind of like oh shoot I want to be over on Treasure Island and so this is actually good. So, all right, next slide please. So as I mentioned, um, we are part of the uh, Java security library team and our primary responsibility is for the Java standard edi edition and the JDK security technologies. Um, we also do a lot of consulting with a lot of other groups within Oracle, um, especially the Java uh, ME organization and sometimes the uh, uh, S, uh, EE organization as well. So we're really after the design, the implementation and maintenance of the different APIs and of course the underlying implementation that goes along with it. So when you or download the Oracle JDK, you're pretty much getting the stuff that we work on. Uh, of course now a lot of our stuff is part of the Open JDK, so most of the Open JDK work that we do um, eventually ends up in the Oracle JDK. So the different libraries that we work with, uh, I work specifically on the cryptography libraries. Did I misspell that? Okay. <laughs> uh, the public key infrastructure, secure communications, uh, authentication, access control, um, XML signatures and so on. So that's kind of a, a, a very brief overview of, of the different libraries that we also do. There's other things like Kerberos and JGSS and SASL and all those different kinds of things. Uh, one of the other things that our group is uh, prim uh, sponsored for or char chartered with I should say is uh, working with some of the vulnerabilities and to try to help other teams assess and understand what the vulnerabilities are so that they can go ahead and get them fixed. Uh, so we'll do some code reviews and you know basically just consult with them. Uh, one of the other things that uh, one of our team members works on is the secure coding guidelines and so that's a um, some documentation be best practices that we can help put out so that you guys can actually look at your code and say oh I shouldn't be doing this, oh maybe this isn't the greatest idea. So next slide please. So for more information, um, now you, if you're familiar with the JDK and the JDK security, you've probably seen these pages already but I thought I'd just throw them up there anyway so that the people who uh, haven't seen them can and uh, for the people that are downloading the slides they can also find where they are. Um, if you go to the JDK documentation, you will be, th these pages will pop right out of course. So um, next slide please. So I did uh, hit a little bit on the secure coding guidelines. Uh, there's actually two documents that are out there now. Uh, one of them is the one that Oracle actually publishes and that is the Oracle secure coding guidelines and if you look on the web, Google it um, or Yahoo being it, uh, you will find uh, the, our document there and it's kind of a, um, it's a shorter document, it's not terribly long but it, it would take you a couple hours to read and I would highly recommend that anyone who's doing any Java coding take a look at this. Uh, there's just things that we see all the time where people are doing public static ints and all of a sudden they don't realize that there is a, you know, way that somebody can grab that value and change it and all of a sudden all of their assumptions that they were doing no longer apply. And so, you know, it's, it's simple things like that and some of them are a lot more insidious and a lot trickier to find but I would recommend that anyone who's doing any programming in Java definitely have a look at that document. Now if you want to go a little bit deeper, well actually quite a bit deeper, uh, the CERT organization has also put out a book and we've consulted with them and uh, it's actually available out in the bookstore. There's a little uh, bookstore out in one of the lobbies there. Um, and it's, uh, they've done, it's probably about two inches thick. It's a pretty thick book and they go into a lot more detail some of the problems that you might have uh, in addition to touching some other things that we didn't mention in our document. So. Okay, so uh, we thought we'd do just a little bit of a recap of some of the things that we did in JDK 7 and then we'll move on to some of the things in, uh, that we're planning for JDK 8 and beyond. So uh, one of the first things that a lot of people have been asking for was an ECC provider or elliptic curve cryptography. Essentially what that does is it allows for much faster public and private key operations. And so we put together a um, ECC provider that's, uh, it's actually native uh, so it will run a little bit faster and it's also based on um, the Solaris ECC provider that's, uh, that's in Solaris. Um, 
unfortunately, we wanted to do a uh, Java-based version, but because of the licensing issues that were involved, uh, this was the best uh, next thing that we could do that would not really run us down into a path of uh, other licensing issues. Um, another thing that we worked on was uh, doing some cert path and TLS algorithm disabling. So you're probably familiar now with that some of the certificates that are based on algorithms such as MD2 are essentially broken or certainly uh, much less secure than, than would uh, be acceptable in some environments. So we have added a few system properties, they're actually security properties, uh, which will allow you to disable certain algorithms or certain algorithms based on the key length that is used to initialize these algorithms. Um, and then uh, the way to configure them is actually there. It's a security property, not a system property. And um, you would just uh, specify that either in the java.security file or you could um, uh, set it through the APIs. So. Okay. Um, now, one of the areas that I worked on uh, is the SSL and TLS, or the transport layer security, which is essentially HTTPS for those who are not really familiar with it. Um, HTTP, excuse me, TLS 1.0 has been the version of uh, TLS that we've had in the JDK pretty much since day one. Um, it has some uh, drawbacks, and if you've been following any of the news, you've probably seen some of those about a year ago. There was an issue called Beast, uh, and essentially what that came down to was a problem that was in the protocol itself. Well, about six years ago, there was actually an update to the protocol called TLS 1.1, and that one addressed the problem that Beast eventually exploited. And so uh, in JDK 7, we do have TLS 1.1, and we also went ahead and, and implemented the next one, which is TLS 1.2. And those are available in JDK 7 at the moment. At the moment, there is no plans to backport these to 6, but uh, if we get enough um, requests, we uh, will certainly consider it. Uh, right now, we're deep in the middle of getting everything ready for 8, so 6 is, adding new features to 6 is a little bit hard at this point. Um, some of the requirements of TLS 1.1 is that we uh, disable some of the weaker cipher, street, cipher suites. So some of those things which uh, depended on the 40-bit version of DES are pretty much uh, forbidden at this point, especially once you get into TLS 1.1 and 1.2. So we have some of those available but just disabled or uh, not enabled by default, I should say. Uh, one of the other things is something called server name indication. And essentially what that is is it's a way to hint at the TLS protocol layer what server you're trying to connect to. So if anybody knows anything about HTTP, HTTP has these header fields that they use that say, I want to connect to host google.com. Well, unfortunately, when you're trying to deal with a, um, a TLS handshake, all of that information about you know, host colon google.com all occurs after the handshake is finished. And so if you want to connect to google.com on a virtual host that is serving many, many different domains, you've got to indicate that information before the handshake completes. And so SNI was a way that was developed uh, by the IETF to address that shortcoming. And so we have added the client side only version of SNI, which is essentially if you s ask for a socket and you say I want to connect to google.com, we will add in the SNI information for google.com as an extension to the uh, client hellos. Um, at the moment there is no server side, but we'll be talking about the server side in the next uh, little bit here. Um, we also have some things for endpoint verification. In the uh, previous days we used to have a hostname verifier and the hostname verifier would uh, uh, try to match up and make sure that if you're connecting to google.com and you get a uh, certificate back that says amazon.com, you say, well, wait, these don't match up. I'm not really connecting to who I thought I was connecting to. So we do uh, a different style of endpoint verification now where we'll actually have the ability to check within the trust manager or the key manager uh, who you're actually connecting to. Uh, and also the key manager and trust manager actually have access to the sessions under construction. And so as the handshake is proceeding, you can go ahead and grab the relevant bits that have already been established and uh, use that to make your decisions. Um, and then the last one, we used to wrap all of our SSL hello handshakes in a older version to support some of the older um, SSL v2 um, client hellos or clients, um, excuse me, we used to wrap our 
SSL hellos in an older version of the hello format. And uh, pretty much those have all gone away at this point, so we went ahead and disabled that by default. Okay. Some of the other things, there was uh, plenty of key tool enhancements. Uh, we used to pretty much only generate self-signed certificates, and there were certificates with no extensions on them. And so we now have a way to actually have a way to create extensions as well as create certificate authorities. So you can have a certificate authority sign a certificate for another entity. And uh, it's, it works pretty well. Uh, there's also a way to grab certificates that are on a SSL server or HTTPS server. And uh, you can grab those and print them out or you can import them into a key store. Uh, JGSS is now using uh, the Kerberos 5 login module by default when there is no JAS configuration available for it. Um, there's a new API uh, extension for something called the Galois counter mode, which is a variant of the AEAD, and I'm going to have to come up with it, advanced authenticated encryption. Yeah, authenticated encryption. Associated data. With associated data, thank you. I should know that. I wrote the, th the thing. <laughs> um, but anyway, there was, uh, there was no APIs to allow for this kind of uh, mode within a, a cipher. And so we went ahead and added a few extensions here and there uh, in the cipher class to, to allow for that. That has the advantage that if we get uh, time, we will go ahead and backport some of the GCM modes that we're going to be working on from JDK 8 when that actually gets implemented uh, back into JDK 7. So you will have that available fairly soon. And uh, next slide. Okay, one of the other things uh, that it, a lot of people have been asking for is to have a list of required algorithms uh, that, you know, pretty much you could be assured that we're going to be existing on every implementation that you went to. So if you ran ours and then you ran an application under IBM, you would at least know that you're going to get AES and uh, RSA and DSA and Diffie-Hellman and so on. So it does help with uh, cross-platform or cross-implementation uh, development. And then uh, there's also the new uh, NTLM SASL mechanism. All right, and that's it for my little section here. And then Jeff is going to talk to you more about what's coming in the next release, hopefully. I assume you're all reading that very carefully. Uh, basically, says you know we're, we're telling you what uh, what we think we're going to do, but uh, subject to change, time pressures, things get moved from one release to another. Uh, things turn out not to be such a good idea when you're implementing them, things like that. So, um, just uh, just so you know, let's uh, start taking a look at what we got here. I will put my glasses on. Uh, so, uh, so what are we doing here? So, we, we we've, we've been moving Java development to a more uh, open JDK, right? Uh, open source development model, uh, and uh, over time, we're becoming. Uh, more and more transparent in our how we set priorities uh, for future releases and uh, what uh, projects we're going to work on, and other people can start proposing things and stuff like that. So there's a there's a, a process behind that, um, and in particular, there's something called a JEP or a JDK enhancement proposal, and that's just a short form description of a feature idea for inclusion uh, in a in a new release. So we're going to walk through some of the JEPs or uh, enhancement proposals that uh, are targeted for JDK 8 at the moment. Um, and if you want to see these online, uh, you can go to openjdk.java.net slash jeps and, and you can see all the things I'm going to talk about tonight plus things that are not security related and you can see them in more detail than I'm going to talk about them here. So there's good stuff to see there. Um, and also, uh, also on OpenJDK, we have a, a security web page that describes more about the group and other things we're doing uh, in the process for participating, uh, uh, you know, in the open source uh, uh, environment. Um, and we have a mailing list that you can see there um, that also uh, is archived. So uh, once again, under consideration, not a promise. Might, some of these might possibly get pushed off to JDK 9 or disappear altogether. Uh, new ones might be added in the future. 
So they're numbered. Um, you can uh, compare these numbers to what you see on the online uh, JEP pages that I pointed you at earlier. Um, so let's uh, start going down the list here. Uh, 113 is called MSSFU, uh, which is obviously an acronym for something. Uh, uh, sounds like it might be an expletive, we're not sure. Uh, <laughs> Um, so it's, it's a Microsoft Kerberos 5 extension, um, and I'm guessing that it was originally designed for the service for Unix uh, uh, Microsoft add-on that you can install on top of Windows that provides you a, a Unix emulation environment if you want to run, uh, compile and run Unix programs. Um, and what it does is it, is it enhances uh, the uh, Kerberos 5 um, uh, delegation mechanisms. So it, it lets a, a, a server that is um, contacted by a client. So a client makes a request to a server and the server authenticates, but it doesn't use, the client doesn't use Kerberos to authenticate itself to the server. So these mechanisms allow the, the server to uh, authenticate to Kerberos on behalf of this client that's, that's, that's calling to them and get a Kerberos service ticket so they can turn around and, and access some back end service or uh, proxy a request with the client's authentication to some other service, you know, uh, as part of its implementation. So these are defined, and Microsoft has published the specifications for these uh, in the open um, if, that anybody can implement. So we're going to look at whether uh, it makes sense for us to, to implement them. Uh, the next JEP uh, is 1.14, um, and that is the TLS server name indication uh, that Brad was speaking about earlier, except it's the server side of that. So in JDK 7, we have the client side. So the client can tell the web server, hey, I'm trying to authenticate you as this host name. And if, and if the server actually serves up content for multiple different host names, virtual host names, uh, then the server can pick the right certificate to send back to the client to, to complete the authentication process. So this is going to be in JDK 8 or in list. In this, in this request to enhance JDK 8, uh, this is the server side of that. So it's mechanisms that can be used in the JSSE uh, uh, Secure Socket Extension APIs that implement TLS uh, to allow a server to uh, configure and control the way that its multiple host names that it can authenticate as uh, get, get uh, process these incoming requests from different clients that use server name indication. Um, so uh, the next one is is the uh, AEAD Cipher Suites, and Brad also talked about that. That's that's uh, implementing. Uh, well, I don't. Yeah, you. It's uh, this uh, uh, Galois counter mode related Cipher Suites that do this authenticated encryption, which is a different style of, of, of encryption block ciphers, um, and um, there's a set of TLS. Um, uh, cipher suites are ways of using that low-level encryption mechanism with TLS. Uh, so we're going to be implementing those, hopefully. Um, um, and uh, 116 is extended validation certificates. So uh, if you've ever gone to a website for like a bank or a stockbroker or some sort of a high-valued financial institution kind of site that's using HTTPS uh, to let you connect to it, um, you might notice that when you, when you go to that in your browser, uh, when that server is authenticated, uh, the, uh, the URL at the top of your browser turns green, or, or, it, or it, you know, it shows some indication that, that this is a, an enhanced SSL authentication site. And so that's, the, that's, that's a, 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 um, a extended authentication that the, the companies that issue public key certificates for use with SSL, go and uh, they, they, if you pay extra money to them, they'll check you out more thoroughly and then they'll give you a certificate that has these magic bits in it that say that this is an extended validation certificate. We really checked you out um, and, and, and then when the browser sees that, it can turn things green. Uh, so we're going to put some uh, APIs into Java that allow Java applications to recognize these things and process them uh, in, in, a, in a friendlier way than currently is possible. Um, so 121, uh, the JEP for this one is titled Stronger Algorithms for Password-Based Encryption. 
So password-based encryption is a way of taking a password that somebody types in and turning it into an encryption key that can be used to do something else, uh, to decrypt something or decrypt some other keys that you use, uh, to, to create keys that are used for communication protocols, uh, encrypting things. So it's a way of taking a, a password that someone might type in and turning it into an encryption key. And we have some uh, APIs for doing this in, in uh, the JDK right now, but they've been in there for quite a while. They're weaker, they're older, the new and better things have come along. So we're going to go through and look at putting some uh, newer and, and higher quality algorithms uh, into the JDK for doing that. The next one is 123, which is configurable secure random number generation. Uh, and I think this is getting at uh, we have, we've, for almost forever, we've had a class called Secure Random, uh, which allows you to get a, a, a stream of, of random numbers or random bits, random bytes. Um, and this is different from the random number generator that's in Java.math, which is just kind of like a handy source of faking it. Uh, to get pseudo random numbers. So the, the secure random API is, is a more secure way of faking it uh, because they're not necessarily totally random numbers, they're just random enough for cryptographic purposes. Uh, they're not necessarily generated by sampling the physics of you know, whatever, um, but they're, they're gathered up by sources of entropy like when a system boots up, you know, what are the interrupt timing sequences that are hard to guess? that happen, what are people, the timing of the way people type on a keyboard and various other kinds of things that gather enough random, unguessable information that you can generate random numbers, seed a random number generator that's, that's good enough for security purposes. And we've had this mechanism for a long time, but it's, it's not, uh, it's a little bit hard to configure it in a way that gives you the high quality that you need you know, for some situations, like if you're generating short-term keys versus long-term keys that you're going to use for a long time, you, we want different assurance levels for the random numbers that you get. And, and so we're, this is all problem not just for Java, but actually for the whole industry. There's um, dev random and dev u random in Unix, uh, and people are finding that they don't really give you enough expressiveness to, to let you ask for the, the quality of numbers that you really need. So this, that's all improving our stuff, working with Unix vendors and other operating system vendors to improve the way that they give it to us as well. So 124 is enhancing the certificate revocation checking API. So what that is is when you, like when you go to uh, an SSL site and it, and it authenticates a, a server, uh, what actually happens is the server sends uh, a list of certificates to the to the client as part of the SSL handshake, and a certificate is just a big blob that has uh, a public key embedded inside of it, and then a bunch of naming information that says what this key is for and who issued it. Um, and so we've had an API uh, since at least 1.3 that lets you uh, get these certificates and hand them off to this API which can go and check them out, make sure they all make sense together and they do what you want because uh, it's all complicated to really, uh, to make sure that these certificates are real and not fake. Um, and so we want to refine this API and give it more flexibility, um, let it support some newer features um, that have been added to the public key infrastructure on the internet uh, over time. Um, and make it uh, more flexible for new, new protocols and new uses of, of uh, certificates. So uh, the next one is 140, uh, and that's uh, called uh, limited due privilege. So if, if you're familiar with the access control mechanisms in Java, um, we, uh, when you make a request to do something like open a file or make a network connection or something like that, when we, when we to, you know, we need to determine should we allow that to happen. Say, say you're an applet, you're downloaded, <clears throat> you're running in the sandbox. So we need to decide whether to allow that to occur. And so the way we do that is we look <clears throat> on the call stack, look at all the people who've been calling in the call stack that led up to this request to open that file. And we make sure that, that uh, the, the code the, you know, the, the Java class that that method is in, you know, some method called in class A called a method in class B, which called a method in class C, and when we go and we make sure that, that A, B, and C 
classes have the permission to open the file that you actually are trying to open. And so there's a mechanism that lets you short circuit that called do privileged. And if you have extra special privileges, you might want to assert your privileges <coughs> uh, by using this API and saying, I know what I'm doing, I don't care who called me, uh, I'm using my privileges to open this file. Uh, and so uh, what this is about is letting you be more specific. So instead of just saying I want to assert all my privileges that I happen to have, regardless of what I'm about to do that needs more privileges, this is a way of describing I am going to assert my privileges to open files in slash temp. And then you go open your files in slash temp. So you're not opening, you're not asserting everything, you're just asserting the actual narrow specific thing that's extra special that you need to do. Uh, so it's, it's a good idea, it's a, it's a prevents uh, certain kinds of, of uh, exploitation security holes where someone convinces you to do something you weren't actually intending to do um, originally. So that's something we're looking at. Uh, 152 is about crypto operations and something called network HSMs. So an HSM is a hardware security module, which is a fancy name for a crypto card or some kind of device that knows how to do encryption operations in hardware. And typically they also have ways of uh, creating and maybe even storing uh, cryptographic keys maybe in ways that the keys never actually leave the hardware device so that software can use a key and encrypt something with a key but it can't actually read the value of the key and like take it and send it somewhere else. So it's a, so an HSM is a generic name for one of these encryption hardware devices. Uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, sometimes they have these things on the network. <laughs> so they're not even on your machine. Like in the old days it would be, you know, back plane in your computer and you'd go and you'd stick one of these cards in there and, and, and put the screws back on and, and there you go. But nowadays uh, some people have, uh, have these things on the network and they can uh, process requests from multiple machines and, and do things like that. So uh, there's been some requests to us to enhance our APIs and make it easier to use such things and fit them in with other cryptographic providers that may be configured in Java, like ones that are software only that we implement uh, and make it all work, work together better. So that's what that's about. 166 uh, is a request to overhaul uh, the key stores that we have. So uh, there's some names of key store types, um, JCEKS and JKS and PKCS12, those are all names of key stores. And a, and a key store in this sense is, is a location of key storage. So it's in reality for these, it's a file. So it's a file the, on the disk and it's filled with a bunch of binary data and uh, in different formats and, and the contents inside the binary data are keys that you can use for encryption or maybe they even contain certificates um, that would be used with say an SSL server that you're going to configure. So uh, we've got these three different formats. The first two of them, JKS and JCEKS are Java specific. There weren't any good format file formats at the time that we were doing this, so we just invented some. Uh, JKS is one that uh, does, not, does not literally encrypt the contents of the file um, because of uh, export encryption regulations at the time that we did it. Um, and JCEKS was uh, similar to JKS except that it did real encryption on the contents of your, of your, of your file. Um, so, uh, and PKCS12 is actually a standard. So there, there's a bunch of security standards uh, called uh, PKCS this and PKCS that that were largely defined by RSA uh, Laboratories, um, which uh, is a company which uh, uh, some of the RSA encryption founders and uh, uh, work for uh, or did. Um, so uh, that is a file format they came up with for uh, primarily for interchanging uh, key material from one platform to another, one machine to another, but we use it as a general purpose key store as well. Right now we support it, uh, but we, and we let people configure it, but we don't use it as the default key store when we ship the JDK for historical and backwards compatibility reasons. So uh, we're going to look at whether it makes sense to actually finally switch to a key store file format that's actually encrypted. Um, 
and and what the compatibility aspects of that are. And we may need to enhance BKCS12 a little bit uh, to, to support support some of the notions that we have in our Keystore API. Uh, so these are uh, three more uh, JEPs which have actually been implemented. <laughs> the ones that I was describing before uh, are ideas um, uh, that are on the list of things to do, but they're not actually integrated into the code yet that you can download and look at and play with. Um, so uh, NSA Suite B um, is, is, a, is a specification document that the government put out, the National Security Agency. Um, and it specifies a standard list of algorithms. Brad was mentioning that in JDK 7, we published our own list of standard algorithms that we implement um, so that we have you know, cross you know, JDK implementations from different companies and licensees all have a standard minimal set. Well, uh, NSA's list is, is larger. Uh, <clears throat> and it's, uh, it's going to be mandated at least for certain government purposes, and it's generally a good thing. It adds uh, some important new algorithms uh, and cipher block modes and things like that. So um, longer key lengths for certain algorithms we already support. So we're going to be implementing, uh, we hope, uh, NSA Suite B uh, across the board so we can just say that we do it. Uh, SSH or SHA-224 uh, for JEP 130 is, is a kind of message digest. Uh, so a message digest, do I have a question away back there? Yeah, um, you say you're gonna do it across the board, does that mean you're backporting it to? Uh, question is about backporting Cypher implementations? Uh, the NSA Suite B. NSA Suite B, backporting the NSA Suite B. So you're doing it across the board, does that mean you're uh, No, I, what I meant was, was we're implementing all of the algorithms that are listed in the NSA Suite B uh, specification. Porting. We're not necessarily backporting. Uh, that's, that's something for JDK 8, we hope. Okay. Um, so uh, so uh, SHA or SHA 224 is a message digest. A message digest is a way of, of taking a bunch of data and making up a short version of it, uh, which like you can use for, comp you can like, um, uh, create a message digest of a file, um, and then later on you can transmit uh, that digest or shortened version of that f of that file, and then and compare it, you know, to a file on another machine, and uh, generate the same thing for the other file, and then and then see if the two digests match. And if the two digests match, then there's very high chance that the that the larger files are actually the same file. It's a checksum. It's a fancy cryptographic checksum. Uh, so um, there's a whole bunch of them based around some uh, government's NSA generated standards for SHA, called SHA, um, and later SHA-2, and 224 is one of those that has a certain length to it, you know, it's 224 bits instead of 256 bits or 512 bits. Um, we'd never bothered to implement it before, it wasn't as widely used as some of the others, but yeah, we're going to do it just for completeness sake. So we do we do, yeah, we do SHA-256 and SHA-384 and SHA-512. Uh, and 224 just, uh, just never got around to it before and mostly people don't care. Uh, so uh, the last one on, on this page, uh, JEP-131, is about doing a 64-bit version of the Windows native library that, that implements uh, the PKCS11 crypto support. So if you, you know, we have um, a uh, PKCS11 is another one of these PKCS things. Uh, and, and PKCS11, rather than being like a file format or something, is actually an API specification. And so it's a way of, of uh, that uh, what hap uh, hardware vendors and people who implement cryptography actually implement this uh, PKCS11 as a library, you know, they implement the methods or the, the, the functions that are specified as part of this API specification and turn it into a li native library. Um, and you can use that library to encrypt stuff with their library. And so we, uh, in Java, we, we have a capability to dynamically load different people's libraries that implement the standard API. Um, and then we can uh, make that cryptographic capability available through the Java APIs automatically. 
So, so you can go to different people and get different PKCS 11 implementations and configure Java to use it, and boom, you can start using it from Java. Um, and so we haven't supported 64-bit Windows versions of this in the past. 32. <clears throat> we have 32, but we haven't, haven't gotten around to 64, so we're doing 64. And that's it. Uh, I should act. <clears throat> I'm going to toss in um, one more thing, and that is something that's sort of kind of related to security, but lots of other things. So we don't list, we didn't list it specifically here, and that is uh, Java modularization or jig, the project Jigsaw. And one of the security implications it has uh, when we implement it, it's now targeted at JDK 9, um, is it's going to give us some new kinds of Java access controls. So when you have a class and you say, oh, my class is public, uh, or my class is not public, um, Java modularity, when we implement it, is going to give you an extra layer of that so that you can have, you can have some code that you write, an application or a library or something like that, and you can specify which, uh, which APIs or classes that, that, that are part of your implementation are supposed to be callable by other people and be public, and, 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 and which of those classes are purely internal implementation and should never be seen outside of your module, or should only be seen by people that you know, are writing other modules that uh, you're closely working together on. Uh, and so that's, that's gonna be an important thing in the future, um, but not in, not in JDK 8. So uh, having gone down the list and given my spiel, um, I people have, I have one more thing to add to okay. the uh, discussion that, that Jeff had. In some of these features that we've been working on uh, that are coming up, uh, there's the list that are actually in integrated today and are ready to go. Uh, there was also the list that's not quite there yet. And if you're interested in seeing those and seeing the progress that's been made on them, the uh, OpenJDK mailing list is where we do a lot of our discussion. And so if you want to see what the current status is of some of these different JEPs, that's the place to go. And of course, please participate in the conversation if you're interested. Yeah, excellent. Have any, uh, any questions? <clears throat> any requests for things that aren't on our list? Um, yeah, I guess right in the back there. Uh, I'm afraid I didn't quite catch your question. Can you repeat it? Would there be any possibility of being the G shot reset implemented and included I think the question I didn't I had trouble hearing it, but I think the question was something about Shaw. Shaw three. Uh, I think that's not likely to show up in JDK eight. Yeah, that's not that's not currently on the list. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, well, this 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 session is really just sort of talk about the library features and and uh, you know future things that we're working on. So we're not really going to address like uh, specific vulnerability things in this buff. Actually, Milton, yeah. Introduce yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so my name is Milton Smith, and I lead the Java security program. And uh, yesterday I did a uh, presentation, and I think uh, when the materials for that are uh, made available, I think it will help answer some of your questions. It talks more about the, uh, the program and, you know, why and when we communicate and things like that. So I think that will be helpful. Do you want to talk about the slides? I've got, I've got a couple slides up. Uh, it's up to you. We'll just we'll okay. just let everybody see it, yeah, because the audio is there and all that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I provided it yesterday. Yep, I don't know exactly w the protocol for when it's going to be posted, but yeah, you had a talk yesterday at eight thirty. Eight thirty a.m. Yep, so you had to be really motivated <laughs> for security. Thank you. All right. Anyone else dare to raise their hand? 
Okay, well, we're going to be we're going to be up here uh, for at least a few minutes. Feel free to come on up and ask uh, questions. Uh, grab us out in the hallway. Um, we can talk a little bit more. Okay. Thank you.